history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. A lot of people have called me a modern-day Indiana Jones because I investigate artifacts, myths, and mysteries here in the United States and beyond. I don't know about that, but like him, I'm on a quest to find one of history's most sought-after and powerful artifacts, the Ark of the Covenant. And the clues I've collected make me think that it could be right here in America. The Bible says the Ark of the Covenant is the wooden chest that stores the Ten Commandments that God handed down to Moses. It's also said to hold immense power. Legend says that if you disrespect it, God may strike you down dead on the spot. It disappeared from religious records around 597 BC. Treasure hunters have been looking for it ever since, but I think they've been looking in all the wrong places. Based on tips in my own research, I've come up with four sites I need to investigate that could prove the Ark of the Covenant is in the United States. There's a mysterious hill site called the Hill of Tara in Ireland where the Ark was last seen. There's a farm in Virginia where a man has an artifact he says came to America with the Ark. There's a museum in Ohio with a stone inscribed with the Ten Commandments, exactly what the Ark is said to contain. And there's a carving in Arizona's petrified forest that looks a hell of a lot like the Ark that I need to examine in person. I don't know how all these places fit together, but I think they could be part of a trail that will lead me to the Ark and solve one of history's greatest archeological whodunits. I think the best place to start is the last spot the Ark was reportedly seen. Well, Murray, I'm searching for the Ark of the Covenant, and I just came here from the United States. So some people believe that the Ark of the Covenant was, was here at one time? Uh, they do, yes. Some people believe that the Ark of the Covenant was buried on the Hill of Tara. Um, this site is a very ancient ritual and royal site. Its oldest monument dates back to 3,500 uh, BC, the seat of the High Kings of Ireland. Some people believed that uh, the King of Tara was also the King of the world. Has any archaeology been done here? Well, in 1899, a group came here to dig for the Ark of the Covenant. They believed that Tara was the resuscitated Jerusalem, and they believed if they recovered the Ark of the Covenant, it would prove their theories. They thought that an Egyptian princess came over in the 6th century BC and brought the Ark of the Covenant with her. And they thought that she was buried here with the Ark of the Covenant. The name of the princess said to be in possession of the Ark was Tia Tefi, daughter of an Egyptian pharaoh. Tefi allegedly traveled here with the biblical prophet Jeremiah. The story of her escape to Ireland after the sacking of Jerusalem by the Babylonians is recorded in an 11th century Irish poem. As the legend goes, she married a king of Tara who entombed her body with the Ark after her death. That's what the group that dug here in 1899 was hoping to find. 
Where did they dig and what did they find? They dug the mound known as the King's Chair because they thought that she was buried in a royal site. Okay, so the King's Chair is um, a stone it's throne, a, perhaps, right? It's, it's a mound. It's a mound, okay. Yeah. Just let me show you um, this uh, book. See them digging here. They didn't follow rigorous scientific methodology. Okay. Now, it was also said that they found a golden bracelet which they threw away into the River Boyne mm. simply because it was not the Ark of the Covenant. They did not find uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody knows where that is. And what do you think? What do I think? Um, I have uh, read and researched um, so many stories about the Ark of the Covenant. It's very difficult to unravel fact from fiction. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was not found here. So maybe it could have come to America. Um, I have come across stories which talk about pilgrims bringing various artifacts to the New World without okay. mentioning what they were. And that's where I'm going next. Maybe I can find some evidence there that will help us figure out once and for all if the Ark of the Covenant made it to America or not. The next stop in my investigation into whether the Ark of the Covenant is in America is Virginia. A man there named Jack Andrews says he has an artifact that came to America with the Ark. It's called the Stone of Destiny. Like the Ark of the Covenant, the legendary Stone of Destiny is another biblical artifact gone missing. It's said to be another name for the stone that Jacob in the Bible rested his head on when he had a vision of a stairway to heaven. And legend says the Ark of the Covenant and the Stone of Destiny were carried together. If this is truly the Stone of Destiny and it's here in America, then it's possible it could lead to the Ark itself. You must be Jack. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see your stone. Good. But first thing I would like to know is a little bit about the history, sure. the provenance. Right. Can you show me where you found it? Sure can. About 10 minutes from here. Well, Jack, this is a beautiful piece of property. How did you acquire this? Well, I bought it about four years ago. And then after we got into it, we discovered it had this stone. The whole prospect of this stone that you found here possibly being connected to the Ark of the Covenant and maybe coming over to the U.S., that's amazing. This stone was given to the guy that bought this land in 1722 and put it in the spring right around the corner where we're going. And it was given to him as a wedding present by Jonathan Swift. So you're talking about Jonathan Swift of Gulliver's Travels? That's the same one. Well, according to Swift, it was the Stone of Destiny. Jonathan Swift is famous for writing Gulliver's Travels, but he was more than an author. Swift was born in Ireland in 1667 and was a cleric at St. Patrick's Church in Dublin, where it's possible he was privy to secret knowledge about sacred religious relics like the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, here is the spring where we found the stone. So what is this here? This is a replacement stone. The original <clears throat> stone was stolen by a group that brought a crane down the river and lifted it off and carried it away. And fortunately, one of the neighbors got a picture of the license tag. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's how we were able to track it down. So. They stole your stone, they you stole. got it back, and then they put a replacement stone here. Right. They actually left that here, we believe, at the time they took the original. I think they planned it. Like you wouldn't notice. Yeah. Why would they have taken it in the first place? I mean, it's been here for 300 years. What did they want with it? They claimed they were building a, the prophesied new city of Jerusalem, and they were going to build a temple to house the stone. And they wanted to have the stone of destiny, right? Oh, yeah. 
Well, I can see the water. It's an active spring. It's flowing pretty good right here into the creek. Obviously, it snows here. You get freezing and thawing. Oh, yeah. Pretty aggressive weathering environment here, so I would expect to see something reflected on the stone, depending on the rock type, of course. This Jonathan Swift, he was a pretty creative writer. How do we know that this isn't something that he dreamed up? Well, um, that's a possibility. On the other hand, he was closely affiliated with the church, might have had access to some artifacts. And I tell you what, if this stone that he was involved in that eventually made its way over here and originally came from Israel is the same stone, I mean, that's amazing. Right. Well, Jack, the only way I'm going to be able to separate truth from fiction is to examine that stone. It's in my barn waiting for you. Let's go. Here's the stone. The stone of destiny. So the theory is that the stone of destiny came from Israel and was carried to Ireland, allegedly with the Ark of the Covenant. I know people search for the Ark at a site there called the Hill of Tara and couldn't find it. That's led to the theory that the Ark was secretly taken to America, along with the stone of destiny. Well, a couple things jump out at me right away. First of all, it's weathered, extensively weathered. And based on what we saw out in the field, the site that you said it had resided for, what, about 300 years? Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks like it's been weathering for perhaps that long, and it's in tough shape. The second thing is, this rock type here, it looks like a sandstone to me, mm -hmm. and I saw nothing like this on site, on no. your other piece of property. So the rock type, the geology is totally different the question is, could this be the stone of destiny that originally was created from rock from Israel? And if the legend is true, did the Ark of the Covenant come over to what is now North America with it? Right. And I guess that's the task in front of us. Maybe it is the first clue that would lead us to the Ark of the Covenant. The rock I'm about to study could be a sacred religious relic known as the Stone of Destiny and a clue that the Ark of the Covenant is here in America. Supposedly, this stone and the Ark were taken from Israel and brought to the Hill of Tara in Ireland by a princess named Tia Tefi. From there, the stone is said to have made its way to America thanks to notable author Jonathan Swift. And maybe the Ark did too. If the geology of Jack Andrew Stone is a match to stone in Israel, it could be an important first step in proving both the artifact's authenticity and Jack's claims it was brought here to the United States with the Ark of the Covenant. If it is authentic, it only begs more questions, like how is it separated from the Ark and where is the Ark now? Okay, Jack, we have your stone here that you think originated in Israel and made its way to Ireland along with the Ark of the Covenant, right? right? Where Jonathan Swift gave the stone as a wedding gift and ultimately he brought it here to what is now your land. That's correct. Okay, well, we have a really good sample here and with the 3D microscope, I'm gonna take a look at this and I'm gonna see if I can see anything here that tells me that it may have come from the Middle East. Go to it.
Okay, so you see all these grains here? Yeah. I'm seeing different colors or different intensities right. of tan and gray. Mm -hmm. And so that tells me there's different minerals. Now I wanna zoom in a little tighter so I can see some of these individual grains. Wow. Now if you look at some of these grains, do you see how they have sharp edges? Yep. Those might be uh, micas possibly. But mm. see all this pore space in here, this open space? Right. That's a pretty important thing, very telling. That tells me this could have come from a desert environment, possibly from Israel. Great. It's clearly in a place that it doesn't belong. In other words, it didn't come from that area. Right. So what's interesting about that is whoever put it there went to a lot of effort. This thing probably weighs at least 1,000 pounds. Yes, yes. They brought it from somewhere else, right. not from here, possibly from what is now Israel. This is a great beginning here. It tells me a lot, but the way I'm gonna be able to absolutely identify these minerals is I have to cut this thing into a thin section. I see. And look at it with a different microscope called a polarized light microscope. Okay. The final test will tell us exactly what its composition is. Okay. I brought a Dremel tool along with me to cut a piece off. Then we're gonna make, Are you okay with that? Yeah. There's no doubt cutting a sample from this rock is controversial. Desecrating a religious artifact is said to bring powerful, even deadly consequences. The small piece of stone Jack had won't work for my analysis. I need to collect my own sample to put under my microscope back home. No one, including me, wants to damage what could be a sacred artifact. But sometimes it's the only way to get answers. And here, it's essential to have the right kind of sample to compare with rock from Israel. Perfect. What's going to be key in this whole thing is getting a sample from where you think that source rock was in Israel. Okay. If this stone did come from Israel, I mean, that's an amazing journey that it's been on. Do you have any other evidence that supports that? We have the book of Tia Tefi, her autobiography, and she was with the prophet Jeremiah. They reportedly brought this with the Ark of the Covenant to the Hill of Tara, where they placed it and it became the throne of Ireland for a thousand years. So it's believed that this stone started its journey in Israel. Then it disappeared from the history books. How did Jonathan Swift get involved? Well, Jonathan Swift was brought up uh, at the Hill of Tara and uh, became a minister. We've documented that. The legend says in 1700, he gave the stone as a wedding gift. Jack, I'm gonna study the stone and we're gonna get to the truth. And if this stone is part of the collection that includes the Ark of the Covenant, it just might lead to the artifact itself. The Ark of the Covenant is one of history's most sought after objects. It's said to hold the Ten Commandments that God inscribed in stone and handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai. According to scripture, disrespecting the Ark can bring deadly consequences. Once housed and venerated at King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, it vanished around the time the Babylonians invaded the temple toward the end of the sixth century BC. That's when priests and disciples presumably carried it out of Israel in search of a new holy resting place. Built of acacia wood and plated with gold, the Bible says it was two and a half cubits in length, one and a half cubits in height, and one and a half cubits in breadth. That's nearly four feet long, two feet high, and two feet deep in modern measurements. Cherubim, or angels, were believed to adorn the top. I finished investigating the Ark's connection to the Hill of Tara in Ireland, the last place the Ark was allegedly seen. I've also met Jack Andrews, who thinks he has another religious relic called the Stone of Destiny that traveled to America with the Ark, but it's something I need to do more testing on to authenticate. Jack thinks Jonathan Swift, the author, sent the stone here to the US in the 1700s, and that maybe he sent the Ark too. While I wait for a sample of Israeli stone to compare with Jack stone, I need to investigate an alternate theory of how the Ark came to America. After the Ark vanished from records in the sixth century BC, 
Many people wonder if an ancient group of Hebrew people called the Lost Tribes of Israel found it and then brought it to America as the centerpiece for a new Jerusalem. Clues were allegedly left behind documenting this journey. I wonder if a carving in Arizona and stone I'm about to see in Ohio are two of these clues. Hey, Scott, can see you. Good to see you. What brings you to Coshocton? Well, I'm investigating the possibility that the Ark of the Covenant may have come to North America. I was recently in Virginia where I talked to a man, Jack Andrews, who thinks the Stone of Destiny is on his property. He thinks it came from Israel uh, along with the Ark of the Covenant. One thing I can say for certain is that the geology of that stone does not match the local geology. And I'm pretty sure that there's a stone here that has a Hebrew connection, and I'm wondering if there might be some evidence that connects it with the Ark of the Covenant. And I know you know something about that stone. I've been a number of years uh, studying some artifacts I call archaeological outliers, and one of the most interesting is the, what's called the Newark Decalogue Stone. Mm -hmm. It was found uh, in 1860 near here in uh, south of Newark, Ohio. Well, the um, inscription on it is in Hebrew language. It has the abridged text from the Exodus version of the Ten Commandments. Well, there you go. The Ark of the Covenant is rumored to contain the two tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. Could this possibly be connected to the Lost Tribes and, and the Ark of the Covenant? Like the Ark of the Covenant, the Lost Tribes also went missing from history. The tribes lived in Israel until the Assyrians conquered in 722 BC. Many people around the world claim to be their descendants, even here in the United States. Some think it's the Lost Tribes, not Jonathan Swift, who brought the Ark of the Covenant to America and left clues behind, like breadcrumbs along the trail they traveled. Could the Decalogue stone be one of those crumbs? My understanding is these uh, pretty controversial artifacts here. Yeah, there is a lot of controversy surrounding <laughs> them, but uh, we could take a look at them and see what we think. Let's do it. This is the Decalogue stone with the Ten Commandments written on it on all sides of it. And this is a stone box that the Decalogue was found in. Okay. So when it was found, it was enclosed in this box, and you couldn't even see the stone mm. inside. The box is carved out inside exactly to fit the Decalogue stone. Well, who's that guy? Well, this figure here on the front that's wearing a robe and a turban and holding either tablets or a breastplate, and over his head in these Hebrew letters, it says Moshe or Moses. Oh. So that must be Moses. OK, that's Moses. All right. Who delivered the Ten Commandments. Ten uh, Commandments. OK, well, we're, we're on the right path here. There's an open uh, slot here. Um, what was that used for? One suggestion that's been made is that that was to attach a leather strap for this to be used as an arm phylactery. So observant Jews uh, say prayers every day with a box containing scriptures bound to their arm with a leather strap. Well, Hugh, it seems to me that it appears to be an allegorical representation of the Ark of the Covenant that contains the Ten Commandments. So whoever it was that made this, if this is genuine, certainly embraced the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. So if they were able to get over here to North America with this, maybe they brought the Ark too. Anything's possible. So what I would like to do is, is hopefully add uh, some more information, some more uh, data to the discussion mm. from a geologic standpoint. So if it's all right oh. with you, I'd like to take a closer look. That'd be great. Wh whoever brought this could have somehow had the Ark of the Covenant. My search for the Ark of the Covenant has taken me from the Hill of Tara in Ireland 
where the ark was reportedly last seen, to a farm in Virginia where a man claims to have a biblical artifact brought here with the ark in the 1700s. But the clue I'm investigating now in Ohio could help prove the ark came to America a heck of a lot earlier than that. Brought here by Hebrew people in search of a new promised land. I want to know if this stone, inscribed with the Ten Commandments, might have been kept inside the ark, or was it left behind as a clue that one of the Bible's most sacred artifacts is right here in the United States? It seems to pass the scrutiny of the skeptics as far as the, the Hebrew text in the language. So now I'd like to try to add some evidence to this whole discussion. This thing is polished after it was carved. It's scratched like I would expect. Well, it's been scratched up by being put in the box and taken out of the box uh, frequently. This little edge right here is a wear pattern yeah. right here. Is that right about where this ledge in the uh, box would be? Well, it fits snug. So the box in itself it took an awful lot of work. I mean, if it, if it was really a forgery, you wouldn't go to all that much trouble to make a box for it. So uh, I think that speaks to its authenticity that someone really was, this was very important to someone. This is a lot of work and it's polished. It's got the detailing of the grooves. It wasn't made, as far as I can tell, from modern machinery. Geologically, I don't see any problems here that would make these things obvious hoaxes. Based on these artifacts, there's no reason in the world to not believe that the Ark of the Covenant couldn't have come over here. Right, it's conceivable that uh, if these people somehow got a hold of the Ark of the Covenant, they could have brought it along with the Ten Commandments. So the skeptics have rejected this. Well, that's been a factor, but the, I mean, Hebrew is an odd thing to find here. The fact that it's odd doesn't mean that it's not genuine. What it boils down to is really, the problem with these artifacts is that the academics don't like them because they don't fit the paradigm. And unfortunately for them, you can't dismiss things simply because you don't like them. Right. And so the evidence to me seems clear. There's no reason not to accept these as genuine, legitimate artifacts. So I've heard the legends about the Ark of the Covenant and the Stone of Destiny in Ireland. I've also heard stories that the Stone of Destiny has come over here to North America and is in Virginia. And if it came over, they believe the ark came as well. And now I've looked at these artifacts here. We have uh, a representation of the Ten Commandments that was carried over here by some early Hebrew group. They made something that was analogous to the ark. So if they could have brought this over here with the Ten Commandments on this stone, mm -hmm. they could theoretically have brought the actual ark. I'm still trying to figure out how the Ark of the Covenant might have gotten to America, if it's here at all. Two basic scenarios are on the table. It's possible that a princess named Tia Tefi brought the Ark of the Covenant and the Stone of Destiny, which both originated in Israel, to the Hill of Tara in Ireland. There, author Jonathan Swift got a hold of them and secured their transport to America. But it's also possible the Lost Tribes or another early Hebrew group first brought the Ark to Tara and then brought it to America, leaving clues like the Decalogue stone behind. One of the things that will help me decide which theory is more likely is whether or not Jack Andrew's stone is actually from Israel. If it is the real stone of destiny as he claims, it has to match stone from that region. And there's still one final clue a carving in Arizona that could change everything about my investigation. But before I check it out, I need to compare the sample I took from Jackstone with the sample I got from Israel here at my lab in Minneapolis to get to the truth about his stone.
Hey, Scott. Let's see. This is the Stone of Destiny, right? Yeah. That looks really good. And then this is the sample from Israel, right? Yes, it is. So what was all this for? There are a lot of people who believe that the Ark of the Covenant came ultimately to North America with the Stone of Destiny. The Stone of Destiny is a stone that Jacob, in the Bible, rested his head on while he dreamt about the stairway to heaven. Now, I recently met with a guy, Jack Andrews in Virginia, who has a stone that he claims is the Stone of Destiny on his property. And one of the things I can tell you absolutely is that this stone does not match any of the surrounding geology. So it didn't come from there. Jack says it came from Israel. That's why we prepared these samples. Mm -hmm. So really, the moment of truth is now. We'll start with this one right here. Now, as you know, sandstones are very unique. So if these things are even remotely close, there's gonna be a, a lot of people that are gonna get excited about this possibility. So this is the Stone of Destiny. One of the things that I see right away is we have quartz, we have feldspars, it looks like maybe a little quartzite. The grains are angular, so this is a sand grain supported sandstone. Very unique. That's what I see also. You see that too? Yeah. Okay. I'm curious to see what the other one looks like. All right, well, let's take a look. I, I don't think a lot of people realize this is like a DNA fingerprint. There's so many unique properties to sandstones. All right. The sample from Israel. Take a look. I've seen enough to make a decision. The Ark of the Covenant is arguably the most sought-after treasure of all time. Designed by God and infused with his presence, it has the power to inspire the faithful and strike down the heathen. Its whereabouts have been a mystery for thousands of years, but I think it's just a matter of time till its location is revealed. A chosen few have always been in charge of protecting it. And what better hiding place for an old world treasure than a new world sanctuary here in America? Jack Andrews agrees and thinks this stone, the Stone of Destiny, can help prove the Ark is here. the Stone of Destiny is referred to in the Bible when Jacob placed his head on the Stone of Destiny and dreamt about the stairway to heaven. And that stone, along with the Ark of the Covenant, which originated in Israel, came to North America. So and is this the Stone of Destiny? That's why we had the uh, sample from Israel sent here. Take a look. It's not a match. Mineralogy is totally different. The size of the grains is different. Uh, there's an awful lot of pore space here. I mean, they're not, they're not even close. It's a different texture completely. Really, it couldn't be more different. Where are we gonna go from here? Well, at this point, I guess what we can conclude is one of a couple things. We clearly do not have a match of the sample 
from Israel with Jack Stone of Destiny in Virginia. That either means that this sample uh, was collected from an area that is not the source of this material in Israel or the material didn't come from Israel. I can't answer that question. If they would have matched, that would have been pretty exciting. But unfortunately, looks like we've hit a dead end with this particular stone. But this investigation is not over. Take a look at this. What are these? Looks like a stone carving. It's a stone carving. This was sent to me by a gentleman who thinks that that could be the Ark of the Covenant right there. And I have to admit that it looks an awful lot like it. Many depictions of the Ark of the Covenant look just like this. These two uh, veils that look a lot like the two angels uh, commonly seen with their wings coming together on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And so, where is this? Arizona. That's where I'm going next. If the Ark of the Covenant is here in North America, I'm gonna find it. The Ark of the Covenant may be hidden in America, brought here centuries ago from ancient Israel. My investigation uncovered some problems with the theory that the Ark traveled here with the Stone of Destiny. So far, science can't prove the stone on Jack Andrews' property is the real Stone of Destiny. Now, I'm leaning toward the other theory I've been studying, that an ancient group of Hebrew people brought the Ark here and left clues along the way. Clues like the Decalogue Stone. I'm headed west to check out the final piece in my quest for the Ark, a mysterious stone carving in Arizona's petrified forest. The lead might be a long shot, but I can't ignore anything that could possibly turn up one of the Bible's most iconic relics. So Jim, you found these petroglyphs when you were on vacation, is that right? Yes, my wife and I came out here a few years ago and see the petroglyphs and the ruins. Okay. But this uh, petroglyph was nothing like I'd ever seen before. So <laughs> what did you think it looked like? Well, it looks like a lot like the Ark of the Covenant. It matches the descriptions but what's it doing here in the Arizona desert? And that's why I called you. I'd like to get some answers to find out what, why it's here. From your pictures that you sent, it does look like the Ark. And I've been tracking the Ark for a while now. If we could find it, it would be amazing. But I'm really anxious to see your carving. So what do you make of that? <laughs> that looks very interesting. I mean, the carving has a, a man here with a hat. Looks like he's got his arm touching this rectangular box that looks a lot like the Ark of the Covenant. Let me show you a couple of pictures of the Ark here. Well, here are your two squares and the rectangle. You have your two what look like angels so how old do you think it is? Well, you know, we're in a desert environment here, so petroglyphs in, in such an arid climate like this, very little rainfall. So things that look relatively new are actually hundreds of years old, which is what I think is the case here. So who do you think may have carved it? Well, I think by association with all the Native American petroglyphs, I mean, right next to it, literally, probably Native American, probably the Pueblo, whose ruins are, you know, just a few yards away. So to me, that makes the most sense. And if they did this, and it is the Ark, then they had to have seen it. So that means somebody had to come through here. Maybe the Native Americans saw the Ark of the Covenant, and they carved this. And this is their closest rendition to it, which is pretty close. And to me, that makes the most sense. I've done a lot of research on petroglyphs and native carvings throughout the Southwest, and this is nothing like I've ever seen before. This does not match anything that's ever been found. I think it is a carving of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, I have to agree with you. And if you look around here, you'll see depictions of animals, humans, and hunting, and it's just more natural scenes and, and life within the native community. And this just doesn't fit that motif at all. This trail that I've been investigating on the Ark of the Covenant has basically moved from east to west. It started in Israel. I think the trail comes here to Arizona. 
You know what, Jim? As I look around here, the geology really doesn't lend itself to a good hiding place. Where do you think they might have taken the Ark? I think it could be one of the caves in the Grand Canyon. Local natives have many stories and legends about ancient people coming to the Grand Canyon. Maybe they brought the Ark. Who knows? Makes sense. I mean, the geology in the Grand Canyon lends itself to caves. We know there's many caves there. Uh, it's almost impossible to get to, and if they did come there, maybe that would be a good place to hide it. Jim, who's to say that the Ark of the Covenant does or doesn't exist? And if it does exist, who's to say that it isn't right here in the United States? The Ark of the Covenant is the most revered religious relic in all of history. And evidence that I've seen suggests that it could be here in the United States. My investigation involved four different sites that are all tied together by their connection to legends about the Ark. Whether Jonathan Swift, the Lost Tribes, other Hebrew people, or someone else entirely is responsible, I think it could be here in the U.S. I don't believe legends of the Ark in America are fiction. I've looked into clues that stretch from Ireland to the Arizona desert, suggesting to me that the Ark of the Covenant being here could be part of a real story, and that there are more clues still hidden waiting to be found. Many people believe that our history, just like the Ark, is sacred and shouldn't be touched. But I'm not afraid to scratch the surface to ask questions that demand an answer. And for mysteries like the Ark of the Covenant, I'm going to continue my search. You're gonna need to calm down, calm down. You gotta lower your voice. I need the account number for that. I need a banker. No, and the pin. How can I help you? So, you need money to build this? No. I have the money. What I need is discretion. OK. Yeah. We can be discreet. You can be discreet. Only you. No one else can ever know who I am. So, who are you? The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. America has always been a refuge for people seeking the freedom to speak their minds 
and practice their beliefs in ways they couldn't elsewhere in the world. As a result, churches, the press, and even secret societies like the Freemasons have all prospered here in the United States. But now, the true mission of one of America's alleged secret societies is being exposed. And it seems to go against the very idea of freedom. I'm on my way to the Denver International Airport, said to house a secret base of an organization that calls itself the New World Order. People have compared members of this illicit group to Nazis, claiming they're hell-bent on world domination and population control. I've been asked to investigate whether it's possible America's busiest airport really is sitting atop the command center for this cryptic organization. I'm here to meet someone who adamantly believes the New World Order has a hand in the Denver airport. But first, before I meet him, I'm going to check out what clues could be hidden around the airport myself. Excuse me. I'm sorry to bother you. My name is Scott. Hi, I'm Elena. Just get off a plane? Yeah, I just came in from Alaska. Okay. I just have a, a question for you. I know this is kind of strange, but did you notice the murals as you went by? I did not. Okay. What do you think when you see this? I wouldn't put it up in my house. It's a little disturbing. I, I don't care for it. It's pretty dark. Some people say these things are cryptic messages of a, uh, a dire future. I don't know what I think, but... I'm going to try to uncover the truth. Hey, Greg, this is Scott Walter. Yeah, my plane just got in, and um, I had a couple minutes to look around at your murals and some of the other things you mentioned, and I tell you what, I can't wait to talk to you. According to some, bizarre signs and symbols at the Denver airport are evidence that the New World Order manipulates everything going on in the world. Supposedly, the New World Order is a sinister organization that counts world leaders and the richest of society among its members. This shadowy syndicate is said to be planning global domination. Its very existence may have been inspired by an older secret society called the Illuminati, which was founded in Germany in 1776. People say both the New World Order and the Illuminati had the same mission, to take over the United States. By the 20th century, Adolf Hitler used the phrase New World Order to describe Nazism. President Woodrow Wilson, Winston Churchill, and even George H.W. Bush used it to refer to a global power shift that would usher in a new age of peace. Today, Many say the mission of the New World Order is population control and world domination. Frightening prospects that I want to learn more about. So Greg, before we talk about some of your theories about the Denver airport, tell me about the New World Order. What is it? Well, what most people think the New World Order is, is that there's going to be a global takeover. They're going to dissolve all countries, and we'll be under a fascist state. So how would they implement this plan? You're talking about taking over the whole world or control of the whole world. How would they do that? 
Well, there's either going to be economic collapse, global economic collapse, terrorist attack much bigger than the World Trade Center, some kind of emergency, and the military is going to move in under the guise of a humanitarian effort. But you realize some people are going to look upon these claims as a little crazy. That's that fine. what you're talking about sounds almost like Nazi fascism. Well, let me show you something. This is the runway for the Denver International Airport. Now, I want you to tell me your gut reaction to this picture I'm going to show you. Don't think about it. Just look at it and tell me what you see. What I see is four runways that are arranged in the four directions, and it looks like a swastika. Right. You know, Greg, on the internet, they talk about that symbol and that it's a subliminal message from the New World Order. And, you know, this isn't the only one. There are many symbols that certain groups have put out into society, hidden in plain sight, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking about groups like the Freemasons. Don't? Absolutely. They're a big part of the powers that be. When I say powers that be, New World Order, globalism, the Illuminati, all the same thing. But it's only at the very highest tier of the Freemasons. You know, I remember when I was at the airport, I saw a Masonic capstone. You know anything about that? Yeah. I've got this picture right here of it. Down here, it's called the New World Airport Commission, as in the New World Order Airport Commission. This is a secret society doing the capstone at the Denver International Airport. OK. Now, who in the hell wants a secret society doing the capstone at an airport. They've got a secret. OK, do you think that they're up to something nefarious here by putting this capstone? Is this, in your mind, a message that's being sent to the people at that airport no. that a secret society is doing something under the radar? They're keeping secrets because they're going to take over. You're going to be living in a fascist state if we don't wake up. I'd say that uh, there's certainly a possibility of that, but again, I need to see the evidence for that, but I'm open to it. Right. Now, let me ask you another question. When I was going through the airport, I remember as I got on the tram, I saw this gold cart that had the letters A-U-A-G. Right. What does that say to you? People think that refers to a certain type of uh, virus and that the New World Order is going to unleash a virus. The AUAG is said to refer to Australia antigen, a deadly strain of hepatitis. But for me as a geologist, it makes a lot more sense that it's referring to the periodic symbols for gold and silver, products of the Colorado mining industry. Do you think that in this new world order, the powers that be, maybe one of the things that's part of their plan is to release a worldwide virus or pandemic on the world, why would they do that? Is it to cripple the population so that they can take over easier? Right. Is it to deliberately reduce the population? Depopulation so they can easier control the people. There's a lot of talk on the internet that uh, there's going to be a terrorist attack on the White House and they're going to move the capital to Denver. Hmm. And That's everybody's sitting around here you know, watching Wheel of Fortune, whatever, you know, going out and doing their big screen TV, completely asleep to what's going on, just like in pre-Nazi Germany. What other evidence do you have that might tie this New World Order to the Denver airport? And there's also the underground tunnels underneath the Denver International Airport. It's 53 square miles. That's huge, huge. It's a big area, yeah. And that could have been used for an underground base. An underground base as large as you're talking about. One of the first things I would want to do is to find out if the local geology here in Denver even lends itself to a base like that. That's why I called you out here, Scott. I want for us to dig and for us to prove that the New World Order has an underground base and tunnels underneath the Denver International Airport. That would be a huge find. It's not about people proposing ideas, proposing theories. It's about the evidence. If we're going to get to the truth of this, we've got to have facts.
I'm looking for evidence of a dangerous secret society known as the New World Order. And not just whether it exists, but whether a secret base is hidden underneath the Denver airport. To shed some light, we need to dig. It's said that this organization is made up of a small group of the world's most powerful people who are planning to stage government takeovers around the world. Uncovering their hideout would go a long way to finding out exactly who's involved and what the New World Order has in store for all of us. Tell me again, what is it that makes you think that the New World Order could have built this extensive tunnel system under the Denver airport? There's a whistleblower, and he supposedly blew the whistle on the Denver airport. He was a geologist. He had a, a high security clearance with the government. He says he went in underneath the Denver airport, and it had, like, I believe, six to seven levels, he said. Really? That leads me to believe there is indeed an underground base underneath the Denver airport. My years of experience have told me the whistleblowers are usually telling the truth because they got a lot to lose. Where is this guy now? Maybe we should talk to him. He died shortly after. They said it was a suicide, but his ex-wife is uh, saying that he was murdered. That sounds really uh, suspicious, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I guess that leads us back to our own investigation here. What I'd like to do is try to get a feel for the local geology here okay. to see if this mass of tunnels that you talk about is, uh, is really a possibility. I mean, if the geology lends itself to that, they could go for a long ways. If it doesn't, then maybe it's not as likely. Bar Lake Park is pretty close to Denver Airport, and so the geology in both places should be similar. The idea of the New World Order hiding a vast network of tunnels here beneath America's busiest airport is a huge yet frightening undertaking. A soil survey from just a few feet deep ought to tell me whether it's even possible to build an underground base like Greg is suggesting. You know what? That's all sand. Looks like it's getting a little bit lighter. Yeah, it's getting lighter in color. What do you think? Tell you what I'd like to do. Clear out all this stuff here. I'm gonna look at it with my hand lens here. Okay. Let me take a look here. Well, you know what, Greg? Mm-hmm. This is mostly sandstone, relatively clean sand. It looks like it's mostly quartz, and we're within a few miles of the airport, so the geology here is probably similar over there. And if that's the case, this type of uh, rock would be some of the easiest material to tunnel through. Uh -huh. So the geology certainly works in your favor as far as a massive tunnel system. Based on what I see here, the question isn't whether the New World Order could have built this tunnel system that you claim. The question now is, did they? So have you tried contacting the officials at uh, the airport, I mean, ask them questions? Yeah, I've called many times and uh, got nothing but rude comments, uh, wouldn't answer my questions, and it's just a dead end. Just blew you off, huh? Yep. I wonder if they'd answer questions if I asked them. Can you give me the number? And I will call them. Sure. All right. You know, there's a, another place that you might be interested in. It's uh, in Georgia and they're called the Georgia Guidestones. I've heard of the Georgia Guidestones. They are a set of mysterious granite slabs placed in the Georgia countryside in 1980. The monument is inscribed with a modern 10 commandments written in eight different languages. What frightens a lot of people is the suggestion that the human race be cut down from 7 billion to 500 million people. No one has worked out who is behind the Guidestones or why they are here but this sounds eerily like New World Order depopulation. Hi, this is Stacy with Denver International Airport. Please leave me a message and I'll get back to you shortly. Hi, my name is Scott Walter. I'm a forensic geologist and I'm investigating claims that there's a secret tunnel system under the Denver airport that's connected to the New World Order. I just like some answers.
My investigation into an alleged secret society called the New World Order has taken me from the Denver airport all the way to Georgia. I want to know if there is truth to the idea that the New World Order intends to reduce the world's population and stage a frightening global takeover. Some say the organization's home base is hidden underneath the Denver airport. Meanwhile, these massive stones in Georgia, called the Guide Stones, which are inscribed with 10 modern commandments in eight different languages, could also be a clue to who is behind this seemingly sinister group. Scott? Gary, how you doing? Good. Welcome to Elbert County. Thanks for meeting me here. Yes, sir. Wow. You impressed? Well, so far, <laughs> tell you what, I just uh, came from the Denver airport, and I'm investigating the New World Order. Many people say that these stones might be part of this New World Order. What can you tell me about these stones? These stones were erected in about 1980, and they were commissioned by a man named R.C. Christian. They're all cut from local granite. Elbert County is the granite capital of the world. These are big slabs, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take a quick peek here. I'm a geologist, so the rocks are of particular interest. And it's relatively flat, but it's not polished or dressed clean. This is a fairly fine-grained granite. It's very uniform. And these are massive slabs. Typically, you won't see slabs this big coming out of a quarry, That's right? That's right. That's right. So whoever did this definitely spent some money, a lot of money. So the message that they're sending is very important. You know, this whole thing about this new world order, we're talking about a small group of people that would set up a worldwide government that would basically run the world in all of us. And many people are concerned about that, and this monument here certainly gives people a reason to think about that. Now, we've got unite humanity with a living new language, rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. That seems relatively innocuous. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Now, that sounds very New World Order-ish. And look at the top. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. If that doesn't sound like a New World Order mandate, I don't know what does. I mean, that's dramatic. And if that is the mission, how would they do that? Are we talking about uh, a nuclear war? Are we talking about a pandemic that's going to kill most of the people on the planet? Well, I think that you have to keep in mind the, uh, the area in which these things were, uh, were built. Uh, this, was, this was done in 1980. That was kind of in the heyday of the, uh, of the Cold War. And I think that the people that put this thing together might have thought that there would be a catastrophic event, that there may be only 500 million left. Well, you and I were both around in 1980. I remember that very well. It was a scary time for yes. the world. Absolutely. And so maybe the people behind this, if it's the New World Order or some other entity, was worried that maybe there would be a nuclear catastrophe and this was the message to the survivors. I mean, that does make some sense. Maybe so. That's, maybe that's what they were thinking about. It's also a calendar. And I don't know if you've noticed, but they've cut this hole through here and you can actually see the sunset and on the summer solstice it's lined up so that you can see that through this stone well what we're talking about here is archaeoastronomy ancient cultures did this all the time they would track the movement of the sun the moon the stars the planets by building structures that would incorporate and capture these different alignments for religious and practical reasons to go to that level of detail tells you something about how these people thought or this rc christian uh, what was going through his head and why he erected this. So can you tell me a little more about this guy? What do we know about him? Well, we don't know too much about him. R.C. Christian is a pseudonym, and uh, he came here with this plan in mind, the details of what he wanted to build and what it needed to look like and the alignment and so forth. So there's not too much known about him. Well, whoever it was, this R.C. Christian, 
He spent a lot of money. And one of the things that I've learned, and I think a lot of people know, is if you want to try to get to the source of something, you follow the money trail. Right. Well, um, the man who uh, was responsible for the financial transactions for the Guidestones is a man by the name of uh, Wyatt Martin. And he was the bank manager. Is uh, he still living? Oh, yes, he is. The problem is, is that he has taken a vow not to reveal who R.C. Christian is. Uh, and he's he said that he's going to take that to his grave. Well, maybe it's time somebody tried to change his mind. Well, good luck. The identity of R.C. Christian, the mysterious person behind the Georgia Guidestones, could be the key to understanding not just who built them, but what the messages on them really mean. Today, only one man knows who the real R.C. Christian was. But maybe by the end of the day, I will too, if I can convince him to share his secret. Wyatt Martin? You got him. Scott Walter, nice to meet you. Scott. Pleasure. I was wondering if I, I could ask you a few questions about the Georgia Guidestones. I've heard of those. I'll be glad to. OK. Quite I'm investigating a group called the New World Order. And some people believe that the Georgia Guidestones could be involved. And I know R.C. Christian was the person that really was behind the Guidestones. And you're the only one that knows his identity. You were a banker, and he came to you. Is that correct? Where That's were you a correct. banker? That's correct. At Granite City Bank there in Elmerton. R.C. Christian came into our town one Friday afternoon in June of 1979. He wanted to get a monument. When he told me what he was going to do with 10 rules of life on it, I said, if you want to benefit mankind, why don't you just take 50,000, throw it out in the street out there, let the wind blow it back, and the poor people get out and pick it up. You'll benefit more people like that than you will with a bunch of rules on a slab of stone. Did he mention anything about a New World Order to you? He used the phrase a few times, the New World Order. but He did? Yeah, that was part of the thinking. When you read those 10 rules, you can see the New World Order very much in there. Tell me a little bit about what he said to you as far as, I want you to keep my identity secret. How did you feel about that? Being a banker for about 40 years, I had to keep everything secret that had to do with a customer's business. Sure. He wanted me to agree to it that I'd never divulge it, and I never have, and I never will. When I when I leave this earth, no one will ever know who put that monument, who paid for it. And he's passed on, correct? Don't you think that the world should probably know who this man was? His main reason for keeping his identity and his group's identity secret was the curiosity of not knowing who did it would cause people to come and read those 10 guides. <laughs> so that hasn't changed. <laughs> I, uh, I can appreciate that. Why the identity of this R.C. Christian could be the linchpin here that could help us understand what's behind this new world order and the secret behind the Georgia Guidestones. And so I'd like to ask you, would you reconsider sharing your secret with me? Wyatt, it's really important to me to know who is behind the Georgia Guidestones and possibly connected to this new world order. Would you reveal to me the identity of R.C. Christian? No. I cannot do that because I gave my word I never would. That's not his real name, obviously. Right. OK, why did he pick that name? And he said, because I am a Christian. And that's a name that I'll use. What's the RC stand for? He never told me. I never asked. Did you have any other input into this project? I did. I helped to get the translations of the various languages that went on the stones.
the ambassador from Pakistan got the translations done at the UN for me. This is the United Nations? That's correct. Do you think there could be a connection with the New World Order and the United Nations in this project? It, it could be. Was there any plans to expand the monument at all? Yes, Mr. Christian's idea was some other person would come forth or another country and finance an additional eight stones encircling the guide stones, and they would have the other major languages of the world on it with the same message. And they would be called the moon stones and would be positioned to follow the movements of the moon. Oh, interesting. This sounds an awful lot like Stonehenge in England. Well, he had been there and seen it. And many people believe that at the time the monument was made, that there was an impending apocalypse that would reduce the population to a fraction of what it is today, and that the guide stones were a place of pilgrimage, if you will, to guide the survivors into the future. Do you think that's what R.C. Christian had in mind? He may have, because the way Mr. Christian envisioned it would be a place that certain people could gather back and reestablish the calendar, the compass, and the seasons of the year. So can I ask you one more time, would you reveal Mr. R.C. Christian's identity to me? I cannot. Well, Wyatt, before I leave, I want to thank you it's really a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. I'm not letting Wyatt's oath of secrecy stop me. I'm heading back to the Guidestones for one last look. My timing for this trip is no accident. Today is June 21st, the summer solstice. Gary told me an alignment involving the sun and one of the stones occurs today. I think it's another clue to understanding if the New World Order was involved with the Guidestones. If this secret society exists, I know that powerful people must be involved with it. Whoever built the Guidestones were people who recognized their place in the universe through archaeoastronomy in the same way ancient civilizations did. Like an acknowledgement, we're all part of something bigger. The Guidestones mark the beginning of summer and are a perfect calendar, perhaps left for survivors of some horrific event the New World Order predicted or planned to enact. One thing that I still don't know is whether the New World Order was involved with strange symbols and an alleged underground base at the Denver airport, about 1,500 miles northwest of here. Denver International Airport, this is Stacy. Hello, Stacy? Hi. Yeah, this is Scott Walter. I'm following up on a call I made. Okay. I'm out here in Georgia, and I just saw an incredible alignment here at the uh, Guidestones. Sure. And I'm investigating the possibility of a connection between these stones and the Denver airport with the New World Order. I understand you have an extensive tunnel system under the airport, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to uh, show me around under there. Yeah, sure. I'd be willing to show you around. You would? Yeah. Great. Not a problem. I'll get back to you soon. Too. Nice to meet you. Thanks for uh, coming out here today. You bet. I'm investigating the New World Order. 
and I've talked to a number of people who strongly believe that there is evidence here at the airport of a highly secretive and, quite frankly, dangerous organization. So what I would like to know, is the New World Order connected to the Denver airport? We have heard these stories ad nauseum since the airport opened in 1995. We have heard that there is a secret underground society, that there are alien structures, that there's underground runways. So many stories. People question our murals. They question our art. They question our baggage system, everything that we do. And I'm afraid that there's not a whole lot to many of these stories. Well, I can appreciate your viewpoint, but if there is no connection to the New World Order, why is it that the Freemasons have placed a capstone here that says New World Airport Commission? It's the New World Airport Commission. It was a group of civic leaders, business leaders, political leaders that all came together to help fundraise and plan a number of pre-opening events before the airport even opened. New World Airport Commission. Exactly. Well, there's the compass in the square. Definitely uh, the Freemasons were involved here. This isn't uncommon. The Freemasons regularly lay capstones or cornerstones at public buildings all across the U.S. What about the secret tunnels I've heard so much about? That there's also a base down here that's supposed to house this elite group of people when all the world gets decimated, the population gets reduced, and they're all gonna come right under here. Do you think we could conceal this from the 53 million people that go through this airport every year, from the thousands of airline workers that work in the baggage tunnels every day? One way that we could answer that question is if you'd let me go down there. Would you show them to me? Yes. All right, let's go. Let's go. All right, Stacy, what do we have here? So what you're seeing now are the remnants of what at the time was a state-of-the-art baggage system when the airport was built in 1995. This baggage system runs all through the tunnels under the airport, and it's not in use anymore. It was very expensive. It took a long time and was fraught with problems to really get functional. And then at a point, we just abandoned it. People have mentioned to me more than once that there are secret underground tunnels here and they insist that they're here, not just here, but below here, and perhaps an underground bunker. There are so many theories out there and ideas of what's going on in these tunnels that there's some sort of psychological warfare testing going on here, or probably one of my favorites is there's miles and miles that connect to Cheyenne Mountain, where NORAD is in the Colorado Springs area, another secret underground bunker. How would we know that? I mean, it could be hidden, perhaps, couldn't it? Well, there are a lot of people that work here. There are thousands of airline employees in these tunnels every day. This would be pretty darn hard to conceal. I have a picture I want to show you. I talked with Greg Erickson, who showed me this picture. And I have to admit that I found it very interesting. He claims that the configuration of the runways looks like a swastika. Well, I think if you were going to eliminate some of the runways, connect lines where none exist, yeah, you could make a swastika if you seriously had that in your mind. But this isn't even what our runway system is going to look like. This is a, a shot today, but once we get all of the runways built out, this is going to be a very different picture. I have another thing that I want to address with you. Um, as you get off one of the trams going to the baggage claim, I remember seeing a cart that had an AUAG. Some people have suggested that the AUAG represents some type of pandemic that's going to be released upon people to reduce the population. I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's go take a look and talk more about that. Got 
got some names here. We've mm -hmm. got fossils. Right. Handprints. The one that we're interested in is right over here. So these are the symbols, A-U-A-G. Gold and silver, and in a mining cart. And I suspect you're going to tell me that this is symbolic of the mining history of Colorado, right? Yes, this represents that. It's a celebration of Colorado history. There's nothing cryptic about this message. It's gold and silver. This is Colorado. This is what we were founded on. It's a way to celebrate the miners that were here before us. The, the infamous mural, right? Yeah. Some people have suggested what that message is that the New World Order has plans to depopulate the planet by using violence and that you guys are part of some big conspiracy. What do you think about all that? This mural in particular gets talked about quite a bit. We have two by the artist Leo Tanguma, and this one is Children of the World Dream of Peace. And it's a two-part mural. So what you just said, though, is a little backwards. You need to read it the other way. Start at the smaller piece, and you look at it, and you realize, no, this is where he starts his story. He talks about what's going to happen with violence, what's going to happen with war, and see its impact on humanity and society. Then you come over here, and you look at all of the children, all of the diversity, all of the happiness when they get rid of the violence, when they get rid of the war. And this is kind of showing what society should be, what we should be striving toward. You know, after everything that I've seen here, you've been kind enough to take me below the airport to look at these tunnels, and I haven't seen anything as far as factual evidence that to me indicates that there's any new world order planning anything in the near future. In fact, when I look at this mural, I see something here that says basically, we're at a critical point in the history of our species. And depending on the decisions that we make right now, we're either gonna have a bright future or we're gonna have a very negative future, but it's up to us. And these, this is a very powerful message. My investigation into the New World Order has proven that for some people, the fear of a global takeover by a powerful and clandestine group is very real. I think this frightening secret society could exist, and Wyatt Martin's admission that the man behind the Guidestones referred to the New World Order proves as much. But according to Denver Airport, the apocalyptic images that adorned the concourses are really a message of the power of peace, while the underground tunnels were part of a dysfunctional baggage system. I think there's no denying that the murals are disturbing, and the Colorado geology could support a base even deeper underground, which will fuel conspiracy theorists who'll still contend there's a cover-up. As for the Georgia Guidestones, I think there is a clear-cut New World Order connection. Although R.C. Christian's identity remains a mystery, I did get confirmation that this man had the New World Order in mind when he put up the Guidestones. Whatever the truth, the takeaway is that signs and symbols that we encounter every day have meaning, just not always the meaning we might expect.
history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Rockwall, Texas, population 38,000. Claim to fame, the mysterious wall said to snake for miles beneath the city. Three farmers stumbled across the massive stone wall in 1852. It's rumored to be 20 miles long and seven stories deep. And people in these parts believe it was the work of an ancient civilization. Rumor has it the wall used to be above ground but the wall and the truth about its origin have been buried over time. I don't know what to think. All I know is I want to see this thing for myself. You must be Adam. You must be Scott. How you doing? Good, good to meet you. Thanks for coming out. Hey, happy to be here. I'm really glad you called about this rock wall. I must have gotten 50 emails or telephone calls about this mysterious wall, so I had to come down and check it out. Yeah, I, I bet you did. It's pretty popular. Obviously, the town was named after the wall, so a lot of people know about it. I brought you here because there's actually a small piece of the wall that's been reassembled here on site at the courthouse. Okay. If you have a minute, I'd like to take you over and have a look at it. Absolutely. I didn't see anything here, but I figured you had us <laughs> meet here for a reason. The wall's right over here. Let's have a you look. You lead the way. So tell me a little bit about this rock wall. Well, back in the 1850s, 1860s, when rock wall was founded, they kept finding this wall, and they would use pieces of it for the wells, the well houses, and some of the buildings. Matter of fact, if you have a look, Right here, we have a restaurant that was built in 1890. Some of the rocks used on the side of it were actual rocks from the wall itself. Oh, so this whole wall here, this is some of the actual rock that that's came exactly from the it. rock wall. That's it. Well, I take it that's not what you wanted to show me, That's though. not exactly what I wanted to show you. Now, this is an actual piece of the wall that was removed and then reassembled here by the Rockwall Historical Foundation. So you can see the rocks as they were, as best they could be recreated. What do you think? Well, I... I think it's very interesting. I mean, these are, like you said, rocks that came from the site. Mm -hmm. But obviously, this is man-made mortar. This has been recently reassembled. I mean, I heard stories about this thing being seven stories deep into the ground. And as a geologist, as far as figuring out if it's man-made or natural, I really have to see it. Sure, I understand. Well, I brought some pictures along for you to have a look at. OK. So if you look at them, tell me what you think of these. Sure. Well, look at that. That looks like a man-made wall. Doesn't it? Yeah. It looks just like the man-made wall we have down here that was taken with the real stones. It really does. That looks exactly like mortar there. You know, as I look at these edges here, it almost looks like they've been worked or tooled. You'll find that with a lot of the stones at the wall. You'll find symmetry on all four sides. You'll find parallel lines. Okay. They don't look like natural geological formations hmm. to most people. Well, those, those look like they could very well have been dressed. And there's a big slab right there. So you don't find a complete randomness to the structure of the wall itself. You find a lot of uniformity in certain places. OK. Like it's been man-made. That's what it suggests to me. Hmm. I'm looking at these pictures, and I mean, I had all these people contact me about this. But before that, I never knew anything about this. Why is that? I think that there may have been a little bit of a cover-up over the years, Scott. A cover-up? And uh, I think there may have been a little bit of a conspiracy to kind of hide the, uh, the nature of the wall. 
What evidence do you have that there might have been one? Well, there have been some excavations uh, that have ended fairly abruptly. Uh, there have even been some experts that came out and checked out the wall, gave some opinions, and then when they mm -hmm. found out some of the other evidence about the wall, they changed their minds and decided they didn't want to publish any of their findings. Why do you think somebody would want to hide this? I mean, if it was man-made, you'd think they want people to know. Some of these people on this land don't want to have an archaeological site on their land because then it can't be developed. So you think people are, are worried about the government coming in and taking their land if this is an archaeological site, and they won't let them develop it? Well, I tell you what, I need to see this wall. The one problem we have is the wall's underground right now. OK, um, aren't there any open excavations? No open excavations. Over the years, uh, people have dug up the wall, and then they always backfill it. Uh, I guess they don't want trespassers on their property. OK. You know what? I remember in one of the emails I got, wasn't there a guy that spent $80,000 <laughs> on an excavation? Yeah. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. His name's Kevin Richardson. He did some excavations on the wall a while back. I think maybe you guys need to meet. Why would a guy spend tens of thousands of dollars digging up a buried wall? Maybe there's something valuable hidden beneath the wall. Maybe he's looking for fame. Maybe he just really wants the truth about whether an ancient civilization, someone other than Native Americans, could have built this. If this huge wall beneath Rockwall is man-made, it would rewrite history in the Lone Star State. And if it was built by man, who could be responsible? One possibility is the Caddo tribe, who lived here since around 800 AD. It could be the Chinese. They started building a great wall of their own in the 7th century BC and are rumored to have made it to America before Columbus. Or it could be people from the very distant past, the ancestors of America's native population. Must be Kevin. Ah, Scott. How you doing? Pleasure to meet you, sir. All right. Have a seat. Well, it's great to meet you. I just talked to Adam, and uh, he mentioned that you're the guy to talk to about the wall. Yeah, I know a little bit about it. Did you really spend 80 grand digging <laughs> up this wall? 80 grand. I wish it was that small of an amount. It was a whole lot more than that. Well, obviously, you're passionate about this wall. I mean, why did you spend that much money? The question needs to be answered. Everybody around here has been talking about this for 150 years. Sooner or later, somebody's got to step up and get it done. Let's find out how old it is and what it is. Well, that is the big question. I mean, is this man-made or is it natural? And I think we hopefully will be able to figure that out. But um, tell me a little bit about the dig. What happened when you, when you did your dig? Well, I brought some photos over to show you. That's a hell of a deep hole. How far down did you go? We wound up going down 42 feet at the very bottom. Wow. We've got another photo here. This is an 11-foot span. That's a beautiful, perfectly straight wall. So what did you hit at the bottom, and what made you stop? I actually hadn't hit the bottom yet, but it began to rain, and it rained for three days, uh -oh. and, and it became a lake rock wall. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty much it at that point. And it all fell into the bottom of the ditch. Oh, it did, it OK. It fell into the bottom okay. of the ditch. We pumped it out and filled it back in with dirt, but the entire wall's laying in the bottom of the hole. OK, so this whole thing is filled back in. Yes. There was a local architect that uh, lived here that uh, produced a map. And in that map, he uh, connected all the dots for the outcroppings of the wall. I don't know if it's accurate or not. I'm a fact kind of guy. Where does this wall go? How, how far does it go? They think it's about 3 and a half miles wide by 5.6 miles in kind of a rectangular shape. If this wall is as old, as long and as tall as people are saying. It could have taken decades to build without the help of modern technology, maybe even more than a century. For comparison, the Great Wall of China, which stretches 13,000 miles, took many centuries to build. If workers died, their bodies were dumped inside the wall, earning the Great Wall the nickname the longest cemetery in the world. Maybe we'll find the same thing here. If the Texas rock wall is really as big as I've been told, it would cover roughly 19 square miles and be seven stories tall. You could fit Cowboy Stadium inside it 169 times. This is a massive undertaking, you realize that? Huge. If it's man-made. 
for y'all to decide. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, all this is great stuff. I love the photos, the map, but I need to see the wall. Is there any place where it's exposed where I could take a look at it? Well, currently, there's no place exposed anywhere in Rockwall. It's all uh, below the grade. But you have to be in luck. I own an excavation company, and we can go dig that wall up for you. Well, I, I, I love that idea, but you can't just go dig holes anywhere. I mean, don't you need a permit to do this? Scott, you're in Texas. You don't need a permit here. You want to dig a hole, you go dig a hole. So, Kevin, you really want to dig this rock wall up again? Sure, what the hell? Why not? But if you're serious about coming out and helping, we'll get that hole dug. If I get a look at this wall, I promise you that I will draw a conclusion. I'm going to tell you if I think it's man-made or not. Well, that's been the problem for years and years around here. Nobody will make a definitive answer if it's man-made or natural. So you're now on the hook to make that decision. No problem. But before we can do that, I need to see this wall. We need a place to dig. I got a place we can go dig the wall up again. The same place I dug before. OK. How soon can we get started? Uh, we can start tomorrow if you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. Before the town of Rockwall cropped up in the 1850s, this land was home to the Caddo Indian tribe. They formed an alliance here and called it Tejas. That's where Texas got its name. It's a mystery who lived here before that. I want to get to the truth of who built this ancient rock wall, if indeed anyone built it at all. I'm on my way to the dig site to see what I'm in for. Until I see it for myself, there's no way to know for sure. Hey, Kev, how you doing? Good, you made it. So uh, what's the plan here? Well, this field right back over here, we're going to excavate about over where that tree line is, up the hill here. OK. They're going to dig us a nice big old hole. How do you know we're going to hit the wall here? Well, about 12 years ago, I dug over in this area, so I got a general idea where the wall's at. You think you can find it? I think we can find it. OK. You ready to go to work? So is this what we're digging with? This is one of them. We got two more machines coming. Two more? Two more. We got yours coming right now. Oh. You're going to teach me how to use it, right? Absolutely. Can we get one a little bigger? <laughs> Our first step, deciding where to dig tomorrow. We're using a map from Kevin's last excavation to figure out where to break ground. It's probably trending right through here. So it's kind of coming off this way. Yeah, it, go on this it direction, goes over this mountain. Roughly, th roughly this direction. So that makes a lot of sense. You should hit it. Tomorrow, we'll start digging up the wall. Some people think it was built by an early civilization and buried over time. A wall that's seven stories deep and 20 miles long shouldn't be hard to find. So far, the photos I've seen make a compelling case that ancient people could be involved. My gut tells me it's not the work of the Caddo tribe. They weren't known for building walls. Even if we rule them out, that still leaves their ancestors, the earliest people to live in North America, or possibly the Chinese, who were believed to have made it to America before Columbus. Right now, I'm headed to the local history museum to find out more. Jerry, I'm anxious to hear about the uh, history of the rock wall. And, and my first question is, when was it first discovered? Well, the rock wall was actually discovered in 1852. And a local farmer and two of his neighbors were digging a water well. And they dug down and hit a hard type of surface. And when they looked, they said, that looks like a rock wall. And that was the original discovery. So do we know when the first thought was that this could be a man-made wall? Well, really, the original discovery, some of the local townspeople saw it and said, 
we believe this was made by ancient man. So that question has been burning in people's brains in Rockwall for a long time. Is it man-made or is it natural? It's the huge mystery of oh, the rock okay. wall, absolutely. This is in 1925, and a gentleman named Count Byron Kuhn de Prorock, he did participate in some digs at Carthage in the 1920s, but he actually wasn't a count, nor was he an archeologist, but he did have a theory about the rock wall, and he was considered the original Tomb Raider. He came in and his conclusion was that this was made by some prehistoric man. Oh, so really? this was a man-made conclusion. So long before we had Lara Croft, we had Count, what's his name here? Absolutely. Okay, well, this is all great stuff. Is there anything else I should know about the wall? Well, actually, some people believe that giants may have built it. Giants? Giants. Rockwall, Texas is named after an enormous wall, said to wind for miles beneath the city. Ever since its discovery, the debate has raged. Is the wall natural or man-made? I'm finding out all I can about the wall, and I was just hit with an unbelievable theory. Is there anything else I should know about the wall? Well, actually, some people believe that giants may have built it. Giants. Giants, like a thousand pound people with large skulls. Where would a story like this come from? Is there any, any evidence? Well, it originated, the story did, in late May of 1886. Our local paper was called the Rockwall Success at that time. And this particular uh, edition had an article that said that the mystery of the rock wall had been solved, that a local farmer had been digging and found a giant skull huge skull, like a half bushel size skull. Is there a skull? A giant skull? Not that I know of anywhere. Well, I have to tell you that as silly as this story sounds, I have uh, encountered giants before. There are too many stories of giants going back in Native American cultures to dismiss them. In fact, uh, in Minnesota, I did a little investigation into some giants that were believed to be in some Native American mounds. Now, thousand pounders, I don't know, but uh, I think uh, the idea of big people in the past is, um, is a real possibility. And I don't disagree with that assessment in any way, but I think if we're relying on these stories to be our uh, proof of that, I don't think that's the right pathway. But if you see the excavations and look at the rocks, they're just so symmetrical, appear to have mortar between them. So they appear to the layman's eye as something that would have been constructed. Okay, well, as a geologist, I've got to see the wall. And I think I'm going to get an opportunity to do that with Kevin. He's talking about teaching me how to use some heavy equipment, actually pulling back some of the earth and looking at this wall. Well, we have a portion of the rock wall on my family's property. You do? We do, and I'd love for you to come see it if you'd like to. Let's go. I'm eager to see the wall in Sherry's backyard. I'm hoping to get to the bottom of this mystery that's more than a century and a half old. In 1852, three Texas farmers were digging a well and instead found a massive wall. I can only imagine the thoughts that went through their heads. The way I see it, there are only two possibilities. The wall is natural or man-made. And if it's man-made, the next question is, who's responsible? The size and scope of the wall would make it one of the greatest man-made structures on American soil. As for giants, I'm still skeptical about that. What are you gonna show me here? Well, the rock wall actually runs underground of this property, but we have several rocks from a 1976 excavation of the rock wall. In any investigation that involves rocks, the most important thing, or one of the most important things you need to know is what kind of rock is it? Sandstone and limestone have been used to build things throughout history. They were relatively easy to cut and shape. 
If the wall is made of either stone, it might support the case that it's man-made. There's a couple things I want to do here. One is a, a simple scratch test, just to get some idea of how hard the rock is. A knife has a, or steel has a hardness of five. And so uh, if it's softer than that, if it scratches it, that means it has to be softer. If it slides across, then, it, then the rock is harder than the knife. So let's just do that. Well, it scratches the rock, so it's softer than a hardness of five. So it's probably in the neighborhood of three to four. It's relatively soft. And I want to determine what its chemistry is. One way I can start to do that is by taking a little dilute hydrochloric acid. And I'm going to drop it on here. And if it fizzes, then it's calcium carbonate. If it doesn't, then it's something else. It's fizzing. Do you see how it's bubbling? Uh huh, I do. That tells me that this is more than likely limestone of some kind. You can see how people might think it was man made. You can imagine these rocks stacked on top of each other with mortar in between. And yeah. I have some photos I'd like to show you. Yeah, let's take a look. In Kevin's excavations, he's also found a few things that he thinks look man made. This is one of them, like a window or a porthole. Well, this is certainly round with small stones in a circular pattern, could be man made. And this is another, like steps mm. going upward. I take it these holes here is what he's calling the steps. Mm -hmm. These are spaced 24, 30 inches apart. <laughs> I guess if you're going to entertain the idea of giants, this would make some sense. Well, I'm not sure about giants, but I do think Kevin thinks this is all evidence for man-made. Well, I can see why he thinks that. And tomorrow, when we start the dig, we'll get some more answers. Heading to the dig site, I'm pretty pumped. So far, I've seen a few things that make me think this wall could be man-made. Photos show rocks piled atop each other that look just like modern masonry. They're connected by what appears to be mortar. And scientific tests of the rocks pulled from the site prove they're limestone, rocks that are easy to cut, shape, and assemble. All this makes me think the wall could be man-made. But first, we need to find the wall. How you doing, Kev? Yeah, Scott, what's going on? What's the plan here today? Well, the plan is we're going to go over here, and we're going to dig from about that fence line up that hill. We're going to dig a nice big hole, and we've got to go find the wall. I can't wait to see the massive wall that's supposedly hidden underneath this field. Kevin's going to dig in the spot we decided on yesterday. If the wall is really seven stories tall, and long enough to enclose 19 square miles, the chance we'll hit it is pretty good.
got wall, baby. You got wall, all right. There's you got the wall. Well, now we know where it's at. So let me ask you this. What orientation are these? Were they vertical, or were they laying this way they were in vertical, the hill? Vertical, running down the length of the wall. OK, so like this, right? Yep. OK. Well, here's my next question. What is the orientation? Is the, is the wall running roughly this way? It runs basically east-west. OK. During the salsa, it falls straight in line with the uh, west sun. Get out of here. East-west, it does. I like that. Yeah. When I was digging up before, that's what it was. It was uh, east-west orientation. Do you think maybe there's a connection there somehow? Uh, that's for you to decide. It's above I... my pay grade. If this wall were aligned with the sun's path on the longest day of the year, that would be important. I've seen solstice alignments before. I've seen them at Stonehenge in England, at the Newport Tower in Rhode Island, and at the Mayan ruins in Mexico. It's called archaeoastronomy. Many ancient people constructed their surroundings with the sun and planets in mind. They didn't have clocks and calendars the way we do. They needed the sun. And not surprisingly, in many cases, they worship the sun, too. OK, well, if this is aligned with the solstice, that could be a huge clue. That This is man-made. Let's dig. <laughs> let's go get him. <laughs> All right, let's drive this sucker. All right, so here's my gas. Here's my brake. Forward, reverse. This tilts the bucket. All right. All you have to do is put it in forward, and you'll move. All right. You ready, Kev? I'm ready, brother. Just turn to the right a little bit, and then, yeah, there you go. Spin it around, and then start straightening the machine up. Go in and give her gas. Okay. And roll the bucket now. Roll, roll. Perfect. Come on. Make your quick turn real quick. Get where you want to dump, and then straighten it out to last. All right. Straighten her out, straighten her out. Up, 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 and dump. Perfect. Quite a hole here. Yeah. We're getting it, Doug. You know what I'd like to do is just kind of bang on the rocks here a little bit, get a sense of what's happening here, and make sure I understand what you've what you've got here. Is this part of the wall here? That's the wall. Of the joint. And that's part of it too? It's pretty hard. I'm getting a sense of where the wall is here relative to the other rock. But I think I've seen um, enough here just to give me a general sense of what's going on at this level. I want to know what's going on down there. We're fixing to find out. We're going to get you a big deep hole. What I'm not getting is a sense of whether or not this wall is man-made. I need to see more. I reached out to a professor, John Geisman, at the University of Texas about uh, possibly doing some paleomagnetic testing. Tomorrow, what I'd like to do is bring John here and see if we can get some more data to try to answer this question. Is this thing a natural formation, or is it man-made by some ancient race, who knows, thousands of years ago? And I visited with uh, Sherry Fowler, and she mentioned giants could be involved. What do you know about that? That was a big rumor about the giants from 150 years ago, but when I excavated up the hill, uh, uncovered a section of the wall that was about 11 feet tall and had three step holes in it, about 33 inches apart. Uh, they were clearly a left foot, right foot, and left foot. So it had to be a big guy to climb out of there. One would think. Do you think the giants built this wall? <laughs> That's for you guys to figure out. <laughs> I'm just digging a hole. <laughs> OK. I'm on my way back to the dig site. Kevin thinks an early civilization may have built the wall that lies buried beneath the town of Rockwall. There's a chance the wall may be an example of archaeoastronomy, how ancient people oriented their surroundings with the sun, moon, and planets. Before we can tackle the archaeoastronomy question, 
we need to figure out if this wall is man-made or natural. And the testing I'm about to do with my friend John should give us a definitive answer. Well, you got a heck of a pile of dirt there. Yeah, wait till you see the hole we got down here. <laughs> Damn, Kevin. <laughs> Look at this. You made a lot of progress. Yeah, we worked a few hours to get that uh, the excavation site that deep. Uh, we're down total about 20-some feet, but uh, the next dig was about 8 or 10 foot, most of it. It sure looks man-made when you stand right here, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I don't see the foothold for the giants yet, but maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see where the joints are? Right. And, uh, I mean, that looks like modern masonry right there. You know, they tooled the joints and... <laughs> I mean, it, it really does. I'm sure glad you went ahead and stepped up and pronounced the walls man-made. That's not what I said. <laughs> That's not sure? what I said. I try not, again if you want. I have not <laughs> rendered an opinion yet. We got more work to do here. Hey, John. How Hi, you buddy. doing? Good to see you. Good. Hey, this is my friend Kevin. This Hi. is John. Pleasure, Pleasure to, to meet you. you. All right. Well, hey, listen, um, I invited John to come out here and help us out. No, basically what we're going to do is measure the magnetism of these materials. You can think of it as an arrow, a memory in the rock, right? Okay. It's kind of like measuring the DNA okay. of a material, kind of. And if this memory is really ancient, say at the time this material formed, then we should be able to very, very easily test whether or not this is an intact feature, undisturbed, versus something that was put together as a bunch of random rocks to make a wall. Paleomagnetism is the study of permanent magnetism in rocks. It's based on the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field at the time the rocks were formed. By studying the intensity and direction of the magnetization, scientists can determine if the rocks are in their original position or if they were moved. Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill cores in the rocks, a number of different cores. I'm gonna orient the cores so we know exactly how they sat out here at Rockwell. Then we're gonna take them back to the lab, we're gonna slice them into specimens, and then we're gonna measure the magnetization in the specimens. Then what'll come out of all this? Well, we should be able to discern whether or not that memory in these materials, right, is consistent through the wall or random. If it's random, one interpretation is that this was put together. By this somebody. was built. By somebody. Exactly. I'll be glad when you all make that definitive answer and everybody knows. <laughs> right now, that's our plan, but we've got some work to do, so Let's should we head, head down? Let's go. John and I took samples from different parts of the wall and noted their exact positions. When we get to the lab, we'll be able to determine the direction of each sample's magnetization. Well, guys, I thought that went pretty well. John, are you happy with the samples we got? The samples are excellent. Scott. Okay, they're gonna work. Okay. They're gonna work. Well, Kev, here's the way I see it. In 1852, when those three farmers found uh, the rock wall digging the well, what they found was one of three possibilities. One is, is that this is an amazing natural geologic feature. Two, it could be a man-made wall by some unknown culture in the distant past, perhaps thousands of years ago. Or a third possibility is it could be a combination of the two. Some culture 
built a man-made wall on top of a pre-existing geologic feature. People of Rockwall, Texas, that's all they've been wanting to know for the last 100, 100, 150 years between you guys. Hopefully we'll get this thing wrapped up and we'll be able to give everybody a definitive answer on what it is. I spent the last couple of days in Texas digging up a massive underground wall. It's the reason for the town's name, Rockwall. Ever since the wall was discovered back in 1852, people have disagreed about whether it's natural or man-made. Many people believe it was once above ground and was the work of some early civilization, maybe even giants. If the wall was made by people, not nature, it could be an example of archaeoastronomy. Kevin thinks it lines up with the summer solstice. That's the sort of thing ancient people regularly did to mark the changing seasons. When I get to John Geisman's lab at the University of Texas at Dallas, we'll use a high-tech process called paleomagnetic analysis to settle the natural or man-made question once and for all. So John, I don't use paleomagnetic analysis in my everyday work, so can you tell me a little bit about it? Sure, Scott. Paleomagnetism is a study of the fossil magnetism in geologic materials. Basically, by virtue of the way rocks form, they have the capability of acquiring a net magnetization that's aligned in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. You can think of this net magnetization as an arrow, simply. If the arrows, the magnetization, point the same way, that proves the wall is natural. If you were using rocks to make a wall, you would almost certainly set them down randomly. So, if the arrows point in a bunch of different directions, that would mean Rockwall's rock wall is indeed man-made. It should be a very definitive test. Sounds good to me. Should we do it? Certainly. All right, John, the money's on the table. Is this thing a natural geologic deposit or is it man-made? What John told me is something Kevin needs to hear. I'm headed back to the dig site to deliver the news. I've also invited Adam, the guy who tipped me off about this amazing wall. Well, guys, um, hey, first of all, I want to I want to start off by thanking you for sending me an email and getting me tuned into this uh, amazing rock wall. So thank you for doing that. Oh, my pleasure. I've had a chance to look at the test results, and it's clear and conclusive. It's a natural geologic feature. It's not man-made. What we found was that the arrows for the stone are consistent. They're definitely all pointing pretty much in the same direction. At least we know the truth now. You know, yeah. we didn't know for sure before. Now we know. So, yeah. When did the uh, formation? When was it created? I was talking to John about that, and we think that this was about 85, 86, 87 million years old. So it's very old. And based on the information that we know now, it predates humans being on the planet. Sure. You know, that's another reason why it, it really can't be man-made. Well, you're the expert. And uh, if we were the experts, we wouldn't have uh, called you. So <laughs> we appreciate you coming out. Everything that you guys have said and thought about this wall being so amazing is still valid. Sometimes nature plays tricks and pulls a fast one on us, and this is one of those times. Good. Well, it's still, still a part of the local heritage, and obviously the town was named for it, so it's, uh, it's good to know that it, it is a unique formation, something we can still be proud of. Yep. Absolutely. 
I mean, it looks like a man-made wall. It absolutely does. This is the most unusual geologic phenomena I have probably ever seen. It turns out this geological formation is a massive sand dike. There are several hundred feet of clay beneath the surface here. Millions of years ago, that clay hardened and cracked. Overlying pressure of the hardened clay forced a juicy mix of clay, sand, and water up through the fracture. Eventually, it hardened broke up naturally into blocks and became the rock wall. It's totally unique. It's, it's really an amazing thing. So nothing to be disappointed about. It's still an incredible, unique feature for rock wall, and they should still be proud of it. I didn't know what to expect when I headed to Texas. A lot of people had written to tell me the same thing. Check out the rock wall underneath the town of Rockwall and reveal the truth about its origins. The three farmers who first unearthed the rock wall back in 1852 may not have found a man-made wall, but they discovered one of the most unique natural geologic wonders I've ever seen. They say people do things big in the Lone Star State, and the huge hole Kevin Richeson excavated for me certainly lives up to that expression. Once the wall was unearthed, I was able to figure out it's been there for millions of years, long before humans ever walked the earth. The wall wasn't built by an early civilization. It wasn't built by giants either, but it's still something Rockwall residents can be proud of. And now they know the truth. The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told.
So, Mike, my understanding is this thing is a dangerous spot. Nobody is permitted on the island. And there's still a pretty good chance that there's unexploded ordnance. Even though there's a danger that we could hit something, right. I think it's worth the risk. The military blew the hell out of the island. Well, that's going to make it a little dicey for us, is it not? My job as a scientist is to uncover new evidence and challenge the history we've been taught. That's what I'm doing here, risking my life, searching for evidence that the Vikings made it to the United States. What I'm looking for is the final clue in my quest for the truth. It's a quest that began weeks ago in Oklahoma where I examined what could be an enormous billboard left behind by the most intrepid voyagers of all time, the Vikings. The Vikings were fierce, seafaring voyagers. In the 11th century, they traveled far from their home in Norway and explored Iceland, Greenland, and even Canada. The question is, did they also explore the United States? I think they did. And the massive boulder here in Oklahoma, inscribed with a message, could be just one of the clues they left on American soil. Well, Kerry, I've had a lot of people contact me and say, you have to check out the Hevener Stone. Obviously, that's why I'm here. But why do you think that people connect this site with the Vikings? Uh, the symbols on the stone are runes hmm. uh, that date back to the Norse and the Vikings. OK. Well, I'm anxious to take a look. Well, there it is. You know what I just love about this? is the runes are so big and they're carved so deep. I mean, it's like a giant billboard. It's fantastic. When was this thing first documented? Uh, I believe the 1830s. Uh, it was the Choctaw Indians that were in the area that started verbalizing that they knew it was here. OK. So we're going back almost 200 years. That's yeah. a long, long time ago. When was the first attempt to try to get a translation? Someone sent it to the Smithsonian Institute sometime during the 1920s and trying to see if they could authenticate it. And what was their reaction to this? I don't think they were that impressed. I think they were a little skeptical of it and believed that it was maybe a local Scandinavian that might have done it. Well, that's not a surprise. The Smithsonian Institute has a history of dismissing these mysterious anomalies. Originally, they thought that it was numerical, that it was possibly a date. Later, they brought in another linguist, and at that point, they found that it meant the words Gloam Dow. Which means what? Gloam Valley. Actually, I've heard that Gloam is a formal name mm -hmm. of an actual Viking explorer going back to the ninth century. Okay. And if he came here, if this is the same Gloam, Gloam's Valley, mm -hmm. What we're looking at here could be a land claim. This Hebner runestone could prove that the Vikings came to what is now the United States. We've got this huge slab of rock which fell off the hill at some point in the past, landed upright, perfect for carving an inscription. What I want to do is I want to take a closer look at the carved lines. This inscription here looks almost essentially the same as the rock. Mm -hmm. So I want to see closely, magnify in here, and look carefully at these carvings and get a relative idea of the age. 
This Hebner inscription is definitely runic, possibly a land claim containing the name of an alleged Viking explorer. For me, the remaining question is the age of the inscription. If I can date this carving back to the Viking age, it would provide strong evidence that the Vikings were here more than a thousand years ago. And that would change American history forever. You know what, Kerry? It looks like it's a quartzite, which is a metamorphosed uh, sandstone, uh, geologically compressed over millions of years of heat and pressure, and made this rock very dense, very hard, and uh, perfect for carving an inscription that's gonna last. The other thing that I see is essentially no change in the color, texture, and weathering profile of the surface of the rock and the surface of the grooves. Now, that doesn't tell me that it's a 1,000 years old, but it tells me that it's not modern. And the fact that it goes back to at least the 1830s, once you start to go back that far, you start to run out of any potential candidates that could possibly have, have carved this as a joke. Based on everything I see, the history, the language, the runes, and the geology, all are consistent with this being authentic. I have to say, in my opinion, you've got a legitimate Viking Age inscription. The Vikings were ancient explorers who braved the open ocean to claim new land. They left their homeland and traveled to Greenland, Iceland, and even made it to Canada. That is where most people believe the trail of evidence ends, but not me. It wouldn't have been hard for the Vikings to get to the United States, even inland to Oklahoma. They could have easily sailed down the east coast of North America, around Florida into the Gulf of Mexico, and up the Mississippi River, where they would have connected with other rivers to end up in Hebron. Or they could have come through the Gulf of St. Lawrence, connected with the Great Lakes, gone down the Mississippi River, connected with the Arkansas River to get to this spot. And that's where I think they may have left a message in runes on this rock, called the Hebner Runestone. This Hebner runestone could prove that not only the medieval Norse, but the Vikings came to what is now the United States. The inscription makes perfect sense. The runes look good. The weathering looks good. And therefore, I have to say, in my opinion, you've got a legitimate Viking Age inscription. It's good to know. <laughs> a lot of people feel that way, too, around here. I have a good sense of this rock, but I'd like to be able to take a look at the, uh, the overall geology to get a sense of how this piece fits in with that. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Scott. What'd you think? Well, it looks to me like a big slab of rock could easily have fallen from up there down the hill. Everything geologically fits. The rock up on the hill matches the Hebner stone, which I expected that, but it does add credibility to the whole thing. Well, I also have some pictures I'd like to show you. Well, that looks like another rune stone. This is the Shawnee Stone here, which was found in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Okay. And this is the Poto Rune Stone found up on Cavanaugh Hill in Poto. 
Are these nearby? Where are these stones? Uh, these are now in the Poto History Museum. That reminds me of something that I saw. A woman forwarded an email to me with a picture mm -hmm. of a rune stone that she found. A few months ago, I received an email from a woman named Nancy Millwood who stumbled upon a rune stone as a young girl. Ever since then, she has been searching for answers to its meaning. The inscription on her stone intrigued me. And after examining the Hebner rune stone, I think there are similarities in some of the carvings. This could be even more evidence. The Vikings were here, but I won't know until I get it into my lab. This is incredible. And these stones together with her stone, I mean, there could be a connection here. All of these stones could be Viking age, and they're all found right here in the United States. The Vikings are one of the most adventurous and brutal groups of explorers in history. They left the safety and security of their villages in Norway and braved the open ocean to conquer Iceland, Greenland, and Canada. Most experts today believe Canada is where their explorations ended, but I think the runestone trail they left behind could be evidence that confirms they went farther south. The Hebner stone I just examined is one of the artifacts that backs up my theory, and I'm headed to my lab to examine another one. This new stone could be one more piece of evidence that supports a Viking voyage to the United States. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for coming by and, and bringing your stone. Well, thanks, Scott. I wanted to tell you about a, a stone that I just looked at in Oklahoma called the Hebner Rune Stone. Uh, it's an amazing runic inscription that I think is legitimate and could provide convincing evidence that the Vikings not only came to North America, but to the interior of what is now the United States. You sent me that picture that had an M mm -hmm. in your inscription, and it looks vaguely familiar to the M I saw on the Hebner stone. There were two other stones found nearby the Hebner stone, and one of those had an M too that looked a lot like what I saw on your stone. Nancy, if these are legitimate Scandinavian runes, and if I can date this back to the Viking Age, you just might have a piece of evidence here that proves that the Vikings made it to what is now the United States. The Vikings were legendary explorers. Their incredible voyages are recorded in books known as the Viking Sagas, which say they traveled from Norway all the way to Canada. I'm investigating where they went next. I think they came to the United States and left clues behind, rune stones for us to uncover. By the 12th century, the Viking Age was over. I think their Norse descendants followed in their footsteps and left more rune stones. Inscriptions I've studied throughout America. One in Maine even has a map that says one of the lands they explored was here in the United States. The stone I'm examining now, uncovered by Nancy Millwood more than 40 years ago, could be a new clue telling us exactly where the Vikings went. Well, Nancy, I recently looked at a runestone called the Hebner runestone in Oklahoma. I'm convinced that it's genuine and does prove that the Vikings came not only to uh, what is now the eastern seaboard of the United States, but to the interior as well. You sent me that picture that had an M mm -hmm. in your inscription, and it looks vaguely familiar to the M I saw on the Hebner stone. If you don't mind, I'm really ready to see this. I would love to show you. Ah. Well, there's the M, and it came out in two pieces. Well, tell me the story. How did you find this? Well, we were on a church picnic in Saluda, North Carolina. I was uh, 11 years old. We were playing hide and seek. Okay. And I walked around under a great big granite rock to hide and actually tripped over the stone itself. You tripped over it? Yes, I did. 
showed it to mom. She asked me to make samples of the ruins on onion skin paper, and we took charcoal copies. I was curious, and we wanted to determine what it was, and I sent samples to different colleges around the area across the United States. This is a copy of the letter that I sent with the copies of the stone. So you really made an effort to try to figure out what this was. You reached out to all these people. What did they say? Um, I have no response, except from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And that was back in the early 70s. So from all these people that you contacted, there must be a dozen on there, only one got back to you? Yes, sir. And what did they say? They suggested that I contact the Smithsonian Institute. We also sent a copy of a rubbing and scraping of the stone to the Smithsonian, and they asked if I would donate the stone for display. Okay, so they wanted you to give it to them. Exactly. And apparently you didn't give it to them. How did that play out? Mom said it's not going anywhere or I'd get a whipping. <laughs> well, your mother was a wise woman because I think that if you had given it to them, I doubt that it would have been on display. In fact, I think that they would have hidden it immediately based on what I'm seeing here. Uh, they would not have liked this. One of the things that jumps out at me right away are what look to be Scandinavian ruins. I'm seeing dots, but this M is very interesting and very telling. You notice how these two lines in the center cross, forming a little X here? Mm -hmm. I'm doing some research on another project that this M might be related to. These are definitely runes, and the use of runes in Scandinavia goes back to at least 400 AD, uh, and they were in heavy use all the way up until about the 14th century, generally. The Viking sagas talk about the Norse traveling to these three mythical land masses. One's called Heluland, one is called Markland, the other one is called Vinland. I believe that Vinland is in what is now the United States. Scholars believe that Heluland, Markland, and Vinland are real locations the Vikings voyaged to. It is accepted that the Vikings started in Norway and sailed west, traveling to Iceland and Greenland, and eventually reaching the shores of North America. Heluland is thought to be the present-day Baffin Island. Markland is believed to be Labrador, which includes the island of Newfoundland. Vinland hasn't officially been found, and scholars still debate its location. But I think Vinland is in the United States, and Nancy Stone could be the evidence I'm looking for. You know, I would really like to get this under the microscope. Sure. Take a look. Go for it. Okay, Nancy, a couple things. This does look to be a soapstone. Unfortunately, because of that, it's gonna be very difficult for me to say with any certainty how old the weathering is. So the minerals that it's made of uh, really don't break down into any new minerals, which is typically what we would do to try to age date an inscription. So what that does is that puts uh, even more emphasis on what the inscription says. There are a lot of really interesting things here that I'm seeing. There are some Scandinavian runes here uh, that would be consistent with the Viking Age. I have a good friend of mine who's an archeologist who's well connected in the Scandinavian runa community who I think can help us get this translated. Well, thanks, Scott. I feel like at times I've hit my head up against a brick wall. Yeah. Because I have no answers and I've already came a lot further today than I was 10 years ago. So <laughs> thank you for all your help. Hello? Mike, Scott. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. 
Hey, listen, I just examined a new runestone that was brought into my office here by a woman. She found it 40 years ago, and it's definitely a runic inscription. And it could indicate maybe that the Vikings were here in North America. We need to get this thing translated. Do you think you can help me? Yeah, definitely. Can you see, send me some photos, and I'll send it to one of my colleagues. But, you know, I have something for you, too. I have a chance to look at a runestone myself. It's under the jurisdiction of the underwater archaeologist in the state of Massachusetts, which is how I heard about it. Underwater archaeologists? Is this thing underwater? It's off the coast of no man's land wildlife refuge, but the island itself is actually off limits. It used to be a naval testing facility, and it is covered with undetonated bombs. But here's why I wanted to talk to you about it. Supposedly, the name Leif Erikson is carved on it. You know what, Mike? I've already studied that rock, and it does say Leif Erikson on it. I wrote about it in my runestone book, basically trying to understand the geology. But I could really use the opinion of an archaeologist like you. Well, the island is dangerous, Scott. I mean, there are bombs everywhere, man. Well, there are bombs everywhere, but what concerns me most is that that inscription could be erased forever. I'd love to join you up there, but there's one place I have to visit first. Oh, yeah? Well, where's that? The only undisputed Viking settlement in North America. The Vikings are legendary for their epic adventures, expeditions that took them to Iceland, Greenland, and the shores of Canada. Right now, a site called Lonsa Meadows in Newfoundland is the only archaeologically accepted Viking settlement in North America. The site dates to 1000 AD, and archaeologists replicated the buildings and structures the Vikings would have lived in. I'm headed there now hoping to find something, anything, that could help me in my mission to uncover evidence that the Vikings came to the United States. Well, Brigida, I think it's amazing that the Vikings made it all the way here. I mean, 1,300 miles from Greenland, 500 years before Christopher Columbus. But I want to find out if they traveled farther south and even made it into what is now the United States. This is the one site that everybody accepts as a known Viking site. How was it first discovered? It was discovered in 1960 by the Norwegian explorer and writer Helge Ingstad. So 1960 was the first time the world knew that the Vikings had come to North America and made a settlement here. When Lonsa Meadows was first discovered, it was instantly dismissed by academics. Scholars refused to believe that an authentic Viking site existed in North America. Archaeologists worked hard to uncover evidence buried beneath the surface, and today it is considered proof that Viking voyagers made it to Canada. It is a discovery that truly changed history. What did the archaeologists find specifically here at the site that told them this was a Viking site? They found buildings of a type of architecture used in 11th century Iceland. And the artifacts that went with the buildings were Norse, also dating from the late Viking period. Some wood artifacts had marks that they had been made with metal tools. Mm -hmm. And the native population did not use metal tools at this point. Away from these buildings, is a little hut where people smelted and manufactured iron for the first time in the New World, as far as we know. Well, that is pretty significant. So the iron would have been for, what, nails and tools and weapons, maybe? Our theory is it was probably just to produce some nails. So would this have been maybe a wintering over type thing, if they came down and winter over, repair the boats, and then in the spring take off and, and either go back or yeah. somewhere else? What the artifacts in general tell us is that 
this is a gateway for further explorations. How far south do you think the Vikings made it from here? And what evidence do we have that supports that? Very often on an archeological site, it's small, insignificant things that become the most interesting part of it. And here, it really was three little butternuts. Butternut trees are not native to Newfoundland, but they are native to the northeastern United States. In fact, they can't grow much farther north than Maine. The fact that archaeologists uncovered butternuts at the Lonson Meadows site means the Vikings must have traveled farther south. The interesting thing with the butternuts is they actually grow in the same areas as wild grapes. And the sagas talk about grape trees. Whoever picked those butternuts and brought them here had also been in areas where there were wild grapes. You have to go all the way down to New England to find wild grapes. Uncovering two key pieces of evidence bolsters my case that the Vikings ventured farther south. The wild grapes and butternuts are essential clues in solving the mystery of where they went after Lonsa Meadows. One of the few places where both can be found is Martha's Vineyard on the east coast of the United States. This is the same place where a runestone was discovered etched with the name Leif Erikson one of the most famous Vikings to ever live. Now I'm headed to examine that stone. If it is an authentic Viking Age inscription, it could be just the piece of evidence I need to determine if the Vikings made it to America. stone with Leif Erikson's name on it that I'm hoping to see, I've actually seen before. But when I visited No Man's Land Island a decade ago, it was in danger of being permanently engulfed by the sea. The last time I was here, I couldn't get an archeologist's opinion on it. So heading out here with Mike is really important in determining whether it's a real Viking artifact or a hoax. There are a few things here that we absolutely know. Mm -hmm. Lonsa Meadows proves that the Vikings came here 500 years before Christopher Columbus. I mean, we know the Vikings had the capability and the fortitude to travel incredible distances. Mm -hmm. And the distance between Lonsa Meadow and Greenland skirting the coast is about 1,300 miles. Mm -hmm. And the distance from Lonsa Meadows to No Man's Island is about 1,200 miles. So it's actually within a range that we know they were capable of traveling. Of course, the question is, did they do it? We need to find an artifact that is unequivocally Viking. And here's what I wanted to show you. Look at this inscription. That is unbelievable. <laughs> 10 years ago when I was here, the stone was underwater, but it was the top was sticking out about a foot. Now, this was taken in the 1920s. This stone, this is probably low right. tide, is high and dry. Right, right. You can clearly see that's a runic L, Leif Erikson. That M uh, is a Roman number for 1,000. There's okay. a one after it, so 1,001. That's consistent with the sagas. It's like Leif Erikson was here. You know, from Lonsa Meadows, they talked about traveling to a place that had a warmer climate. There's only one direction you can go to get a warmer climate, and that's south. I have investigated rune stones all over this country. I believe some may be Viking inscriptions, but I think a few unique stones were actually left by Norse explorers in the post-Viking age. The Spirit Pond rune stones in Maine are one example. The medieval Norse carved these inscriptions, which include a map that points south and says Vinland takes two days. 
I think the Norse carved this map to mark the voyage their Viking ancestors made hundreds of years before. The sagas clearly indicate that they went south, a place where grapes grew. This place is called Martha's Vineyard, a vineyard, yep. grapes, okay? So the climate fits. We have a stone that says Leif Erikson, 1001, it all fits. I say Vinland is right here. The Viking sagas tell of seafaring voyagers who cross dangerous waters to conquer new lands. So far, Lonsa Meadows is the only undisputed Viking site in North America. But I'm on a quest to find out the truth about where they went next. I think they went south all the way into what is now the United States. They left clues behind that support this theory, a breadcrumb trail of runestones. The Hebner runestone and Nancy Millwood stone could be two of these clues. Now, I'm on my way to examine another rune stone that just happens to say the name of possibly the most famous Viking explorer, Leif Erikson. The expedition could be dicey because of where the stone is located, but I always say, no risk, no reward. So Mike, as you know, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this question. Did the Vikings make it all the way down here to Martha's Vineyard area, right. and specifically to No Man's Land Island? And, uh, the evidence likely to convince a lot of people is the No Man's Land Island runestone. And I was here 10 years ago, but I got beat up pretty bad in the water, and I'm hoping that we can, you know, get out to the inscription and take a look at it, you especially being an archaeologist. But this thing is a dangerous spot. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a big butt. No Man's Land was used as an aerial gunnery range for years, from 42 to 96, and the Navy was dropping bombs all over the place. It's actually now a national wildlife refuge, but nobody is permitted on the island. And there's still a pretty good chance that there's unexploded ordnance, not just on the island, but in the water around the island. Even though there's a danger that we could hit something, right. I think it's worth the risk, because the inscription supposedly says Leif Erikson with Roman letters that say M and a 1, which would be 1001. That is consistent with the Viking sagas. We know the Vikings made it to Lons and Meadows around the year 1000. That's an undisputed fact in archaeology, in history. Sure. We know that happened. And no man's land is basically the, the last body of land you, you get if you're coming south and you're heading into this incredibly protected series of, of natural harbors and bays. So if you wanted to leave a marker that said, hey, this is a good entrance way, no man's land, that would be a good place to leave a marker. We have a potentially important historical artifact. It needs to be preserved. I don't even know if it's still there. If this is Vinland, and if there is some kind of a settlement in association with the stone up on the bluff, then there would be artifacts in association with it but the military blew the hell out of the island. Well, that's going to make it a little dicey for us, is it not? <laughs> well, Mike, the stone is over there. It's the second one, the second big one over there. Hey, Scott, can you get us any closer here? No, we're already pretty shallow. There's a lot of big rocks in here, and I don't want, you know, I don't want to lose the keel. Well, what are we going to do? We've got to get over to that rock. I can radio ashore and see if I get somebody to come out with a smaller boat to get you in there. Well, Mike, we're going to need a smaller boat. Push up. It's the second rock. See those two that are staggered there? Yeah. You're 
you're okay here. There's one right here. Got it. Perfect. As soon as we get close to the stone's location, I knew we were in trouble. My worst fears had come true. Even though I know the stone that says Leif Erikson is here, there's no way we're going to see it today. Well, Mike, can you see that rock just to the right of the big boulder? It's, it's underwater. Yeah, just submerged there. If you watch the wave, you can see the stone. It's right there. There's no way we can do any research on that underwater. Even though the stone is right offshore in only five feet of water, it's too dangerous to go any closer. There are too many unexploded bombs on the shore and in the water surrounding the stone. Now, why do you think it would be deep under, deeper underwater now than it was when you were here last time? It's a geologic process that's ongoing. This is glacial sediments. The waves are pulling this down. I mean, you can see it's, it's eroding right now. That rock, at one time, this bluff was up here. Yeah. And it was probably sitting at the top of the bluff. It had to be exposed. They carved on it, right? It's all right. So over time, it's eroded the bank. It slid down. In the 1920s, it was on the beach. When I came here 10 years ago, it was a foot higher than it is now. So it's sinking. It's literally sinking into the sea. We have this potentially incredible historical artifact, a 1,000 years old, documenting a trip of Leif Erikson to Vinland. This is Vinland right here. And it's sinking into the sea. Why don't the archaeologists want to preserve it? As an archaeologist, what, what I would say is that you know, context is critical. Um, you, you don't want to remove an artifact uh, from its original location unless you have to. Now, there could be an argument to be made here that it is now at risk of, of vanishing forever. And so therefore, it needs to be removed, it needs to be preserved up on land. OK, and I can appreciate that. But it's not so much that it's going to sink and be gone, although that is a concern, but the continued wave action for all we know, may have destroyed the inscription already. I mean, we have to get it out, but it's not going to happen today. We're going to have to go. All right. I know that runestone says the name Leif Erikson. That tells me the Vikings came to the United States. All the evidence I have uncovered in my investigation points to this location as the Vinland from the sagas. The Hedner runestone in Oklahoma is essentially a Viking land claim. The stone Nancy found has similar runes, and the evidence of wild grapes and butternuts found at the Viking settlement in Newfoundland points to the Vikings coming here to the United States. Seeing that the runestone was almost submerged was a real disappointment and the unexploded bombs along the coastline make it too dangerous to navigate underwater. Now, it's inches away from being erased from America's history forever. The Viking sagas tell amazing stories of a courageous, brutal, seafaring people making a landfall on this continent long before Columbus. Even though Lonsa Meadows is the only universally accepted Viking settlement in North America, I believe they made it further south to the United States. Mike did get me a translation for Nancy Millwood's runestone, but it was inconclusive. Even so, I believe it needs to be taken seriously. In fact, I believe many runestones found across the United States make up the final unwritten chapter of the Viking sagas. Clues have been left here that will tell us the truth about the Vikings, but it is up to us to find them. In the end, it may not be an archaeologist that uncovers the truth. People just like Nancy Millwood stumble across artifacts all the time. And these artifacts are the key to unlocking the past 
revealing the real history of the United States.